It was her idea to start this uh, Foolish Things Salon, and she derived the name from um, a biblical verse that she uh, is familiar with. And uh, anyway, so let's go ahead and begin with the program. Um, I want to have fun with this topic. It's a very uh, interesting and serious topic, but um, it's one with lots of potential ideas and thoughts that are very uh, uh, provocative and interesting as alternatives in the way that people handle uh, defensive uh, measures uh, for, of protection in, in, uh, in society have been throughout history and are very relevant to today. So I wanted to introduce some ideas that, that came to me over, over the time. They aren't new to me. These are ideas that have been around for, uh, for a very, very long time. Um, a lot of us here do recognize uh, that they're in a competition between private services and government services, uh, very often the private services excel because of the competitive choice that people have. In a competitive market where consumers have choice and, uh, and servers cannot force their customers to pay for their services, they have to please them with either better services, better prices, more innovation, and the kinds of things that um, often result in uh, a, a better, more practical, and ethical result for us. Now, most people accept this on things like postal delivery, uh, railroad delivery, uh, transportation, food, clothing, and a lot of things. But an area that seems to be um, sort of closed to the idea of competition has been in the field of... Uh, of protective services such as um, uh, military action. So I've titled this uh, topic here, uh, Private Military Action, <coughs> merely to explore maybe some options. Um, Ron Paul, uh, as you know, is a, a candidate for the Republican uh, presidential nomination. He's one that uh, doesn't often get uh, as much maybe exposure as some of the other candidates, but he has some very unique and interesting perspectives on things. When he was asked his thought about uh, military protection, he raised the issue of letters of mark and reprisal. Now, not too many people are familiar with that because, well, not too many people today are very familiar really with the, the Constitution, and Ron Paul is very much so. And he notes that this was a, a provision written into the Constitution, Article One, for the powers of the Congress, uh, section 8, um, and uh, authorizing the Congress to issue or, or authorize letters of mark and reprisal. Now first let me give a little bit of background and history of this. Letters of mark and reprisal for hundreds of years was actually something practiced by most governments of the world um, because it was very efficient, a very low cost, and a very uh, well practical way of handling uh, protective and defense measures. It began in uh, 1203, or at least the, the, the earliest record of such letters of mark and reprisal um, was under uh, King Henry uh, in England in 1203, in which he just simply didn't have um, the armed forces to retaliate against enemies of England that were harassing them, attacking, and um, so he basically gave a letter of permission to privateers to act on behalf of England to give reprisal to actions, uh, enemy actions against, the, against England. Now, the nice thing about this was that he didn't have to raise the armies and navies to do this. It was a very costly thing and a very uh, difficult thing. But there were a lot of private shipping companies all over the world, merchants who were doing trade all over the world. Now, <clears throat> if they went out and conducted an act of, uh, 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 of uh, violence against another shipping company or an, uh, the, even the... the um, the navies of another country, uh, anyone acting on their own would be treated as a pirate among, uh, 
the uh, governments of the world at the time, and uh, any individual action would have been uh, deemed an act of piracy and subject to, well, summary execution. I mean, you'd be caught and hung for doing such if you get caught. But this was a way of authorizing private individuals to act on behalf of the governments that were authorizing them, saying, well, I, I can't hire an army and navy to be everywhere, but I will authorize you to do acts of reprisal against the enemies of this country. And they were very effective. Um, because part of the motive for doing so was like a bounty. Um, it was the prize of the merchant ship or the ship itself, it was a, if it was an em enemy um, uh, combatant ship. Uh, you, but you would have to bring it back to the Admiralty Court at your home country, the country that had issued the letter of mark and reprisal. And you'd have to uh, show your letter uh, that you had legitimate authority to do so. And you had to uh, uh, demonstrate that you treated the people that you captured well. Uh, I mean, as they were uh, captives of war, you know, soldiers of war. And uh, the prize then was splitting, the, pri uh, the, the, the bounty was splitting the prize of the ship, whatever the cargo was, and the ship itself. Uh, they would sell off the, the ship and, and split up the, uh, the prize. Well, that was a, a huge motive for privateers, as they were called, uh, to enter into this kind of activity. Um, now, they had to be pre very careful about it, but there were enormous rewards for doing so. Um, if they were captured you know, d in, in wartime, uh, having captured one ship and then were returning and were captured by another, if they didn't have a letter of mark and reprisal authorizing them to do so, they were hung as pirates. Okay. Um, but if they did have such, they were treated as uh, prisoners of war, treated well as was expected of uh, any other prisoners of war in, uh, in wartime in those days. Well, uh, this, uh, we, we have a lot of people in, in history that are renowned for participating in this. So Francis Drake, for example, is a very famous uh, Englishman who uh, roamed the high seas uh, going after Spanish galleons and frigates at the time of uh, wars between England and, and Spain or with France. Uh, more recently in American history, uh, Robert Morris, who was the wealthiest person in America, financed much of the American Revolution, uh, was one who was a privateer. He was owner of privateer ships. Even George Washington was an owner of privateer ships, ships that had letters of mark and reprisal authorizing them to act on behalf of the U.S. government. Well, of the, of the uh, American Revolution. Actually, the American Revolution itself was kind of an act of individual action, um, rebelling against, you know, the authority of the time, rebelling against the King of England. And once they constituted a, a government and a constitution, they sort of embedded in the constitution these rights of individuals to protect themselves when they felt that they weren't being protected. Of course, the Declaration of Independence was all about the right to overthrow a tyrannical leader and, and establish a, a rule by consent of the governed. When that, abuse, when that authority was abused. And embedded in the Bill of Rights of the Constitution uh, was the right to bear arms, which is uh, an acknowledgement of the right of individuals to protect themselves and that they uh, uh, could do so by their individual right of uh, protecting their own inherent in in inalienable, unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Part of the Constitution was to authorize letters of mark and reprisal. This was done in the United States. Um, uh, the pirate Lafayette uh, was one who acted in this manner uh, in protection of the United States at the War of 1812. Um, even when the Civil War broke out, there were ships that, uh, that carried letters of mark and reprisal from the uh, Confederate uh, government, as there were from the Northern government. Now, in 1856, um, many of the European governments recoiled 
at the efficiency, you might say, the effectiveness of many of these privateers. And they came to an agreement that they wouldn't do that anymore among themselves. The United States was not a signatory to the Treaty of Paris in 1856 that authorized, uh, uh, that, that put an end to uh, the privateering. Actually, they officially said that they would end privateering, but individually they kept doing it to some degree because it was so essential at times. I think uh, Simon Bolivar, uh, when he couldn't rouse uh, troops uh, to, to defend against the armies of Chile, he authorized them later on just as a, as a desperate measure to um, to fend off the uh, forces that were coming down on him. Okay, fast forward to today. Ron Paul actually introduced two uh, bills in Congress uh, just about the same time as the uh, uh, September 11 attack on the World Trade Center. One was in response to widespread piracy, as you know, across the, off the shores of Somalia and in um, the Malacca Straits in, uh, in near Indonesia. The fact that American shippers, well actually shippers worldwide, were being told by the governments, do not arm yourself, you'll be in trouble, you're not allowed to come into a port with guns on board, uh, don't worry, we will protect you. But of course they didn't, yeah. Uh, you would see a, a super tanker with uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of oil on board that was taken over by a little uh, skiff with five pirates on board that, uh, that could take it easily because no one on board was uh, either allowed to be armed or they were in fact advised, don't resist. Uh, go ahead and pay the, the ransom. That's cheaper than, um, than the trouble that could ensue if, we, if you did try to protect yourself. Well, Ron Paul s thought that this, that they that ships and shipping companies should be allowed to protect themselves, just like you have a, an iron, uh, uh, you can hire a security company to protect a building downtown, uh, you should be able to protect your ship at, on the high seas. Um, there was a lot of concern that airplanes weren't allowed to protect themselves against hijackers, and he argued that if they were authorized to protect themselves uh, and not rely on the government to protect them, they might have uh, prevented such things as the 9-11 uh, attack by the hijackers uh, who ba basically took advantage of the fact that no armed resistance was on board. Uh, furthermore, um, there was an argument that Ron Paul puts forward with regard to the defense of, or the reprisal against people like Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein, who I, I might add a little footnote in here, it's well acknowledged that in the 1980s both of those people were heavily armed uh, and supported by the US government in the US government's effort to have Saddam Hussein spearhead uh, the overthrow of the Iranian government, that the Osama bin Laden and the Mujahideen were heavily armed by the United States covertly to uh, oppose the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. So what were once allies uh, later became uh, enemies and a lot of the problems that the United States faced were ones that were at least partly of the, of the um, construct of uh, U.S. foreign policy. Well, Ron Paul was saying that if there's an attack by a terrorist, then in a sense it was like the pirates of the high seas who did attacks on uh, on uh, Americans, um, but it isn't a whole nation that did it. It's a, an amorphous gang of, of thugs and terrorists that you can hunt down and get, get to, much like a bounty hunter could um, in pursuit of a prize, and very effectively. Now the effectiveness of private forces was demonstrated by Ross Perot when the Iranian revolution occurred and hostages were taken, American hostages were taken across Iran. Um, well, there was the Ross Perot approach in hiring his own soldiers to go and rescue his own company employees very successfully. And um, then the uh, Jimmy Carter's approach that was, well, you'd have to say much less than successful with the eight helicopters crashing out in the desert and 
and a, at a much greater expense. Um, so that's a, a proposition. Uh, is it possible to uh, accomplish the objectives of reprisal against genuine terrorists without involving hundreds of billions of dollars, thousands of lives of Americans, many thousands of lives even of innocent civilians as well as, as uh, uh, whole nations uh, abroad by the issuance of prizes, of the bounties, uh, by authorizing letters of mark and reprisal for getting the villains without a lot of collateral damage in the process. Um, one recent example of a successful private military operation uh, was that of executive outcomes. Now, executive outcomes was a, a very elite group of military personnel in, the, um, in South Africa that had been uh, charged with uh, attacking and going after combating the African National Congress. But after apartheid was ended, there was a whole regime change in the political scene in, in South Africa, uh, these military personnel, highly skilled and professional in their approach, uh, actually joined forces with um, a lot of the military personnel from the African National Congress and formed executive outcomes. In fact, about 20% of their uh, personnel were white, 80% were black, and they offered their services for hire. Now, there were three instances in which they were hired, and they proved themselves very effective at uh, achieving their ends at very low cost. One was in rescuing <coughs> some kidnapped victims in Indonesia. Another, as their, uh, their stated objective, is to only go to military action on behalf of a legitimate government in defense of that government. And uh, so they were hired after an election in Angola in which uh, the uh, government of Angola was attacked by the UNITA forces that didn't accept the election results. So they were hired in order to uh, put down the rebellion. They were quite effective at that. Much more uh, germane uh, in, in terms of humanitarian um, results was in the case of Sierra Leone. And Sierra Leone, you may recall, was uh, a time in which um, Charles Taylor in Liberia was funneling a lot of uh, weapons and support into what was called the, um, the uh, uh, Revolutionary United Front, a very, very ragtag guerrilla group of, uh, of rebels that were intent on taking over all the resources of Sierra Leone, diamond mines and copper mines, platinum and so on, things like that. But they did this in a reign of terror across the country. And the reign of terror consisted of very common, the cutting off of hands and legs of victims all across the country, of raping women under the most atrocious uh, circumstances and then killing them, of um, forcing children into their army, drugging them and handing them guns and pushing them into the front lines. Um, massive and widespread uh, murder. And they, because of their terror tactics, tens of thousands of them overran the country in a very short order. Now, the government of Sierra Leone was pretty ineffective at uh, stopping this. Uh, the military itself was unprofessional, un unprepared, poorly led, poorly trained, and uh, poorly equipped and um, corrupt and it was collapsing all around. So the government of Sierra Leone hired executive outcomes that sent 300 personnel to the country and within, I think, two or three months completely defeated the um, uh, United, uh, the, the Revolutionary United Front that was very disorganized and, and very ineffective, completely defeated them. They were extremely popular in, um, in Sierra Leone by the general population that felt they, their lives were saved because of these 300 men. 
The total cost in that year of operation was about $20 million. And they had 300 billion. Now, there was an extraordinary international outrage of the idea that a private military of mercenaries, people who would be up for hire as hired guns to come into this action, were used. And so the United Nations, the United States, put on enormous pressure on the government of Sierra Leone to, um, uh, to rescind their contract. Well, uh, part of the peace agreement between the rebel forces and the government was that the rebel forces would disband and uh, executive outcomes would be sent packing. They would be asked to leave the country. They did. Within a couple months after that, the rebel forces reformed, completely took over the country. The United Nations sent 18,000 soldiers into the country at a cost of a billion dollars a year to try to repel them. 500 of the UN forces were actually kidnapped and captured by the, uh, the rebels. It was a disaster. Um, and thousands more people died as a, as a consequence of this. Um, so you'd have to ask yourself, well, what was the motive to be so outraged at a private military accomplishing this objective? Was it that there is something inherently wrong about a private military hiring itself to do so? Or was there just a tremendous abhorrence in the West about the thought that private uh, companies could do this? If they had been around to, to just the year afterwards in Rwanda, they might have also saved the, th the hundreds of thousands of people who basically were slaughtered because the rest of the world just stood by. But if 300 people with so little cost could put an end to rebellion, that would be nice. Now, one of the things that has shaped the public attitude about uh, private military in recent years is the fact that whereas letters of mark and reprisal are not authorized for, for uh, private companies to act on their own, they do always, uh, they do act pervasively on behalf of the U.S. government in Iraq and in Afghanistan. My understanding is that out of, uh, there may have been 150,000 soldiers serving in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, and maybe as 100,000 of private contractors there. And among those are many private military companies, one of which, the most famous of which is Blackwater, which was renamed XE because of the, um, well, the bad publicity that came down on them because of a, a shooting incident in which uh, uh, dozens of probably innocent civilians in the, in the center of, of the country were, uh, were shot down uh, in a very, very bad uh, mistake. Now, I think Blackwater was definitely in the wrong in that case. The nice thing about a private company is that you don't have an automatic loyalty or allegiance to defend them. If it's a private company that does something stupid, they can be held accountable. They can be fired, they can be prosecuted, and all kinds of things that you can't necessarily do to a military of a government when they do things that are uh, horrendous and kill people and, and uh, result in slaughters. Um, why was Blackwater hired? to do all of the protection for, or most of the protection for State Department officials, visiting dignitaries, the CIA. Why were they hiring them, except that they were extraordinarily effective and trusted more than the US military in doing these tasks? Well, a lot of it is fraught with controversy. And so um, I don't know if we, well, we. I have a film here, but I'm going to wait with the film, actually. I think I'm just going to open it up to the discussion. There's, there's, there's a lot of brilliant minds here that can help me sort through whether or not this is uh, a good or bad thing, private military action. And then uh, those who are interested, uh, uh, maybe after a little bit of time, I, could, I can show this, uh, this film uh, about executive outcomes and their actions in Sierra Leone later. Yeah.